All right, welcome back everyone to the last session of today here on this main stage, The Loft. I'm so excited to, for this one session because I think it's going to be very, very exciting. I do not even know exactly what, what is awaiting us, but I know it's going to be amazing. <laughs> so let me start off with um, who is here on stage with us. This is Mark D'Inverno, who is a professor of computer science and Pro Warden International at Goldsmiths University of London. He has an MA in mathematics and an MSc in computation from Oxford University along with a PhD. His interdisciplinary research interests are at the intersection of artificial intelligence with creative activity, music, design, learning, and social science. He is also a critically acclaimed jazz pianist and over the last four decades has led a variety of bands across a wide range of music, including the Mark D'Inverno Quintet. And I'm very excited for this talk, this Thank interactive you. talk, which is called Muse, Not Musician, AI's Role in the Future of Music Creativity. Give it up one time for Mark. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I didn't know that was happening. Um, I, this, this microphone uh, is working. Thank you very much indeed for that very warm and generous introduction. Um, I'm interested in this, so I'm going to play you some music. I'm, I'm interested in what is musical creativity. I'm both a musician and I've taught pretty much all my life and I'm a, a professor of artificial intelligence. And I'm interested in exploring that question as a musician, as a researcher. And I, just as we listen to some jazz here, what is happening How is it that musicians can play together? What is it to be creative? And how can AI support us to be more creative? So here is the big kind of tension for me as a scientist. If you look at this word creativity, it's so ubiquitous in the way, in our language, the way we talk about anything music, art, technology, and it comes in politics, it, it comes in sports. And part of the problem is the way that we use words. And my view is that if you look at the history of science, there's a big tug of war between creativity as a lived human experience and creativity as this power in the mind. I hope by the end of the talk, you'll have a very strong sense of where I believe creativity sits. But at the moment, thinking about creativity as a mental power is winning. So before I speak, I want to kind of give you just one minute of improvisation. I'm going to sit at the piano, this beautiful quiet piano, and I'm just going to improvise. And I want you to think about what you do when you lose yourself in something. It, maybe it's not music. My guess is you're here because it is music. Whether you're listening, playing, composing, recording. What is it? What is going on for us? What is the lived human experience when we're doing something which takes us out of ourselves? So I hope you listen, but I also hope you reflect on what it is that you do, because I'll be asking some questions maybe and some posing some ideas. OK.
so what's going on there? Oh, that's very good. <laughs> thank you, Frank. <laughs> thank you. It's, it's very hard to kind of solo in a... But anyway, I appreciate it. Thank you. But this word, creativity, what, where did it come from? Well, these, if you go online, you type in creativity, and it turns out there was an explosion around the 1940s and 1950s. And partly, if you trace it back, in 1950, the psychologist J.P. Gilford, Gifford, sorry, said, creativity is the thing that we have been missing in psychology. We need to take this seriously. And he said something very important. He said, it is a power in the mind. It is something that psychologists should be exploring. It is something which generates novelty and originality. Now, if you look back two years before this big address in 1950, and it's amazing how science has modes and fashions, just like any other human um, exploit, human activity. In 1948, there was a book, Unlocking Your Creative Power, Power in the Mind. And there is at least one theory, we think, myself and Arthur Still, who I work with, that this inspired the science of psychology. And this is something which occurs quite a lot in the history of science. It's something called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. We take an adjective like creative, or we bring something into existence and treat it like it's a noun, like it's a real thing. And that causes dangers. Some examples of what I would call misplaced concreteness include artificial intelligence, include well-being, include creativity. Because we're taking something which is natural and a lived experience, this word creative, and we're turning it into something which exists in the mind. And that is where I think lots of problems lie with artificial intelligence. So as a researcher, I'm both keen to explore and build systems, but I'm also mindful about the role we want AI in our society. Now, I'm kind of evangelical about this because 10 years ago, I edited a book called Computers and Creativity without thinking about what this word really meant. And I was quite happy to think about the ideas of computers being creative. 10 years later, I think that is a huge mistake. And the problem of like, what's happening? Oh, sorry. I Trying to make people laugh. Good. If I'm comfortable, uh, thank you. I don't mind using this. Is that is that better, guys? Thank you. This is way better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. So we go back to this idea of about 100 years ago, someone called John Dewey, who no, talked we'll about. Thank you. Yeah, one, two. I can use the handheld. I think if you leave it like that. Okay. Let's just play the piano for 30 seconds and relax from this technological failure. I feel better now. Um, <laughs> thank you. I have to say, you've been wonderful with all this sound check and all this stuff. Um, so this idea of, of John Dewey of 100 years ago was actually creativity is there for all of us. And it can be with music or cooking or gardening or anything. It's about an energy, an awareness, a zest, a vigor for life, a moment by moment embodiment of playing the piano or painting or whatever we do. And for me, that's stronger. That gives us a stronger idea, a more democratic idea that being creative is there for all of us. You don't have to play the piano. You don't really have to be good at anything particularly as long as you put yourself into it. Now, why does this matter? 
It matters because of the way that we think about playing music. This psychology definition, this definition from the 50s about being original, originality is easy. I will play something that no one has ever played before. Thank you very much. Um, so, so in some sense, originality is, is not what being creative is about. Creative is about being aware of you and the space and this piano and trying to make something happen by putting myself into this. Okay, I mean, I could, I could carry on, but a simple idea and develop it. And you can see me trying to make it work. That's such an important part. It is a lived experience that we are sharing. So I set up this tug of war. Creativity, which is about focus, engagement, inquiry, experimentation, zest, energy, vigor. And then this idea, this what we call this fallacy of misplaced concreteness, this power in the mind, which generates originality. And if we go back and we think about the link, the novel products of advertising. So I work at Goldsmiths. Goldsmiths is an incredible university, part of the University of London. And I'm interested in AI to support learning. And we have lots of musicians that have come through and been very successful. In Europe, you will know some of them, but a range of, it's a very small college, maybe 10,000 students, but we have lots of people who've made a fundamental difference to the creative and cultural industries. And here's one of the things that I think is really important when we understand musical creativity, this idea of feedback. If I'm playing the piano, all of the time I'm listening to everything that's going on. So the only way to get better in life is to get feedback. And um, it's very interesting. I spoke to my partner, Melly Still. She's a director in London. And I said, what's the thing? She, she directs at the National Theatre and other places. What do you most want from the people that are working for you? And she said, the ability to take feedback in the rehearsal studios. So it, it is a human gift to give and receive feedback, which is culturally sensitive, sensitive to the human and what they're trying to do. Now, we tried to build, if you, and if you think about, so let's go back to my band, that's enough volume. So all of the songs I wrote with someone called Francois Pache, he's famous, he did Daddy's Car, which was the first AI song, I'll come to that. But all of the time, feeding back, what works musically, trying ideas, and then the rehearsal. You've got the band there, and you're trying ideas. Again, it's finding ways to talk to each other, which are human and which makes sense. And then, of course, in improvisation. Let's just move on. So when the sax player is playing, I'm listening. I'm trying to work out how to play with them. So. I was kind of interested in can we build systems which support this creative act of feedback for students who can't really afford one-to-one -one tuition. And this was a large European project uh, at uh, Goldsmiths. Hi, I'm Mark Inverno. I'm the Pro Warden for Research and Enterprise here at Goldsmiths. Goldsmiths with a fantastic tradition of producing alumni uh, that have done fantastic things in the creative and cultural. Let's just move it on a bit. I'm, I'm not going to show too much of this. but. Try and encourage people to go online and give feedback and receive feedback <coughs> on works in progress, music particularly, but across any kind of other creative media. And I think the easiest thing to do is we just show you very simply what happens. I'm at home, I'm playing the piano, I'm composing a song, or I'm writing a piece of music, or I'm writing film music, or I'm practicing for a performance, and I want to know how to get better. And the way to get better is to get feedback from other people. So here I go. I press play. Press record, I should say. I press upload, 
and then I'm going to hand back to Matthew to say what happens next. So I've, I've recorded this piece. What happens now, Matt? Right, so the recording's been uploaded automatically to the Music Circle system, and you can now go in there and start listening to it and placing comments along, along the recording. Fantastic. And it's great for self-reflection, so you can, you can sort of use it as a notepad of your recording. But you can also then take that recording and share it with a community of, of other people so that they can also comment or reply to your comments. So okay. if, you, if you hit that share button up the top there, yep. you'll see that you can share it. You know, it's shared with the friendly piano players community. <laughs> and I'm actually a member of that community, so I can go in and I can post my own comments. Okay, so that's available for you to look at. It's called musify.com. It's a social enterprise. But here is the kind of fundamental question which I've set up. What is the role of artificial intelligence in musical creativity? So on one hand, if you think that it's about power in the mind, if you think it's about novelty, if you think it's about originality, then it makes perfect sense to think about AI as being creative. If, on the other hand, you take the view that creativity is a human lived experience, a way of engaging with the world, it makes absolutely no sense to think about AI as being creative. And these two pictures kind of sum it up. There's a huge amount of work in a field called computational creativity, the idea of exploring how machines can generate art and music. But there's a danger. And here is one example. Um, this was billed in London. We, this was on in the West End. Uh, it was a program made by Sky Arts, and I was the consultant on this program. And if you look at the sentences, it says, uh, uh, the world's first computer-generated musical. <coughs> Not really. So what AI can do is it can seed ideas, a character, one line for a plot, maybe some notes for a tune. Ah, I give them some of my uh, system away there. Um, but the human process of taking those ideas, of shaping it into a story, into characters, into narratives, into harmony, into songs, into things which made sense, it was entirely human. So we must be unbelievably careful as a society about the claims that AI made. In the previous talk, we heard about the idea of engaging with the process of making work. That's what makes us human. And let us be very careful about what we say that artificial intelligence can do. So great project, really exciting, lots of interesting systems. But fundamentally, it showed us that AI cannot write a musical. So let me show you some systems which come from the other perspective collaborative agency, the idea that a system supports me in becoming a stronger musician, a better musician, a more reflective musician. And I'll give you one example, again working with Francois Pache at Sony Research Labs. This idea as a piano player that you're sometimes frustrated because there's only two hands and you want to have a beat, you know. Uh, let me try and think of something else. trying to do everything. You've got the drum, you, you're getting that beat, the drums are there, the bass line's there. But what if you could do it for real? So here is a system which you feed it with bass lines and chords and you create a new performance context. You put the bass line, then you put the piano line in, chords in, tune in. So now I have a system which increases my performance capability.
So this makes sense to me, the idea that we're using artificial intelligence to create musical copies of ourselves to create new performance contexts. So, so we've used a system that was on BBC Radio a couple of years ago, and I'm just going to show you this system now. I'm going to try and demonstrate it. Here's one of the things. I just want to say one thing more about science. Lots of work done using AI to create musical systems. This was a quote in a paper which looked at 75, all of the major systems. And I only saw it last week. It said that we were one of the only groups to think about how do you evaluate it? How do you evaluate AI in music? And I go back to Dewey. It only makes sense if you start with the experiences of the musician and the experiences of the audience. If you're not doing that, what problem are you trying to solve? So here we go. Here's the, I'm just going to do some live demos, just to give you a sense of where I think we need to be thinking. So, so here is the first system I'm going to play to you. I don't know if you can see that. You can see that. I haven't really explored this, and I'm using an electric piano sound. We couldn't get the... Um, so this is an example of a system, just like a plug-in in Logic or something, that does exactly what you expect it to do. probably make that interesting for about another three seconds <laughs> and then I'd run out of ideas but it's simply a parrot it's simply playing back to me one second later and it's like a pedal a foot pedal I guess entirely not autonomous because I control exactly what it does what is what is the most autonomous and stupid system that you can have Ah, it's already started without me, because it's completely autonomous. I didn't expect that. Okay, hello, let's play some music. Now, here is, a, here is probably the biggest, so autonomous. It wasn't listening to me. It was completely random. But I could still, because I'm a human and I'm a musician, I could still just about create a musical performance. Here is a trick which is used a lot, this idea of energy in music. So the only thing this system is doing is listening to the energy, the number of notes that I'm playing per second. So let's just see what happens. Can I create a performance? much of a performance, but you can see how that idea of energy is a really important tool in thinking about how we might work with artificial intelligence. And now the most sophisticated, using Markov models and looking for clues in the, in the way that I play, in the notes that I play, in the phrasing that I play, in the onsets that I play. I've really only played with this once or twice, but I'm going to finish with this. Uh, we're calling it Song for Berlin with a Poly Markov model. Um, it will probably be in all great record shops by tomorrow. So here we go.
so what I'm interested though is I still don't think of that machine as being creative. It's providing me with new opportunities to explore human creativity and to explore what audiences might want to listen to. And whilst I think that's kind of interesting for a few minutes, ultimately, playing the piano... <laughs> ..or humans playing with each other, I think fundamentally that's what music is about. And we should be very careful about how we think about artificial intelligence. It's about provoking, stimulating, and supporting all of us as humans. Thank you very much. Wow, Mark, thank you so much for this. I think we have one or two questions before we wrap it up. So the first question is, does AI foster creativity or does it hinder the creative process? This is, this is the key question. And I think this is about, it's about what we as a society want to do. I mean, if you think, just think about cameras and how easy it is now to take a picture, how easy 30 years ago you had to look at the aperture and the focus and light and everything. And now it's become easy. And are we happy as a society that somehow taking photos, we've lost some of the ability to put ourselves into taking pictures? So my view is that we should think about artificial intelligence as enabling, provoking. I talked about this state of grace that we all have. Whatever we're doing, when we lose ourselves in playing the piano. And I mean, I do sit down most evenings and play the piano for a long time. A couple of, an hour, an hour, an hour and a half. If we can use artificial intelligence to support more people to engage with creative activity, then it's going to support. But we as a society need to understand what we want the role of AI to be. And I, and I think it's really important that we don't allow it to take over human creativity. So, great question. Okay, and the second question is, when is feedback constructive and when is it destructive? Yeah, that's a nice question. Um, so, I think, it's, I think it's really challenging. And, and uh, I can answer, explore that with a, a way that perhaps art is taught at Goldsmiths. So, the third years, undergraduate, second years and first years are all together. Someone comes with some work. And the group work together to give feedback on that. And if someone says something which is perhaps too personal, perhaps too disrupt disruptive, perhaps too destructive to look at the question, then the group work as a whole to bring the feedback back to a constructive place because they're aware of the nuances of how people are feeling. So it's difficult for me to say, and, and you might argue that a really hard-nosed piano teacher can get the best out of uh, students. My own view is it goes back to uh, what was said by the head of design on one of my slides. It's a profoundly, deeply personal, nuanced thing to give feedback. You have to be so careful, especially in things like music and art and creative practice in general. So, but it's a kind of personal question. Mm. I might think I'm really, you know, giving you feedback to say, I love the way you introduced me, thank you very much. And you might think, oh God, I hated the way he gave me feedback. <laughs> so it's difficult. And I think it's culturally sensitive as well about the way you give feedback to each other. So it's again, it's this idea of creativity, moment by moment awareness of what it is that you're doing in exactly the same way as playing the piano. Yeah. Great question, thank you very much. Thank you, thank another you warm much. round of applause for Mark. Thank you, thanks very much. Thank you. All right, and we're going to be wrapping up slowly day one of Most Wanted Music. Quick show of hands, who's coming back tomorrow for sure? So most people, amazing.